good morning everybody and hello welcome to you all um hope that you're all well uh, welcome to uh, and thank you for joining our webinar on cash is king managing cash flow changes to vat and resolving disputes my name is paul gibbons and i'm the founding director and chief executive of decipher consulting and I was reading an article published on the 11th of February uh, 2021 by Begby's trainer, who are an insolvency practitioner. And they stated that they had found that there had been uh, an 11% rise in construction companies who may now face significant financial dis distress due to the pandemic and ongoing uh, VAT matters. So we think that this uh, webinar today is quite apt uh, and hopefully you'll take uh, some information away which will assist with your ongoing uh, positive cash positions. The webinar today will consist of a presentation from two speakers. Uh, Dominic Mondino will provide a, a brief presentation on contract administration and Kevin Hall will provide a brief presentation on the new VAT rules. We will then have a panel discussion on managing payment disputes and this will be moderated by Carlo Tajelski, and we'll be looking at uh, adjudication and the smash and grab. Uh, what does it all mean and what does the future hold? Uh, some practical tips for preparing for adjudication and avoiding disputes and unnecessary costs. And at the end of the session, uh, we would welcome any questions that you may well have. Uh, so please put them in the Q&A or the chat and we'll try and facilitate those if we have time. So moving on, I'm pleased to be joined today with uh, Dominic Mondino. Uh, Dominic uh, started his career as a trainee quantity surveyor in 2000, and he progressed uh, through the ranks before reaching commercial manager. Uh, Dominic has overseen the commercial aspects of many high profile projects over his 20 year career in the construction industry, working with main contractors and clients. Uh, Dominic joined Decipher in 2020 as one of our senior consultants and supports our clients in understanding quantum issues and resolving disputes. Most of you hopefully will know Bill Bordill. He's also on today's webinar on the panel session and uh, he is one of the three directors here at Decipher. He's an experienced quantum expert and dispute resolver. He's a discipline lead for quantum surveying within Decipher Consulting and he combines his role as an APC assessor for the RICS and Bill maintains a direct an active involvement with current issues on live projects and is also an RICS adjudicator as well as a quantum expert and a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators. I've mentioned Carlo Tajelski, he's a barrister at Crown Office Chambers specialising in commercial, construction, insurance and professional negligence matters. Carlo is, re is recognised as being very good on his feet and is praised for his meticulous and forceful cross-examination and preparation. He has been described as incredibly forensic in his approach to work, and exceptionally bright, hardworking, and responsive together with a charming personality. I'm also pleased to be joined with Philip Harris. Philip is a partner at Wright Hassel. He is a solicitor advocate and practices as a commercial arbitrator, mediator, and adjudicator and his knowledge of construction law has been described as second to none. He has over 30 years experience as an experience, uh, sorry, 30 years of experience as a construction lawyer. And his work has seen him supporting clients on projects in all areas of construction and civil engineering throughout the UK. And finally, but by no means least, we are also joined with uh, Kevin Hall. He is also a partner at Wright Hassel and Kevin advises on a wide variety of clients on the VAT issues in particular, including property deals and construction works. Kevin also writes and lectures on VAT and has contributed to HMRC's VAT manuals specifically in relation to financial advisors. So as you can see, we've got an esteemed uh, panel uh, on the, on the uh, panelists today on the, on the panel session. So hopefully there'll be some, uh, some good, good conversation to be had. So without further ado, I will now hand over to Dominic for his first presentation. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you, Paul, <clears throat> and welcome to today's webinar, Contract Administration for Maintaining Cash Flow. 
Cash flow is crucial for all businesses and ensuring that payments are coming in and going out on time is important for financial stability. You can help this to be achieved by considering the following points. Firstly, understand your contractual obligations you have signed up to. It's vital that you understand them. There is a tendency for employers, main contractors, to amend standard forms of contracts and in cases heavily amend where it becomes very biased and the risk falls full onto the main contractor or subcontractor. I have experience of this from the main contractor and subcontractor perspective. The amendments are more likely to trip you up. Therefore, it's important that key obligations are highlighted and considered prior to the agreement of the contract. It is important that you follow um, Sorry, it's important you follow the processes for preparing valuations, consider timeframes, information required, and when for. Ensure your valuations are robust and substantiated. Ensure you are clear of what is expected of you under the contract for preparation and agreement of variations. It is also important that you follow the conditions for payment terms, notice requirements, and timeframes for submission and agreement. Okay, understanding your contractual obligations. All major construction contracts are different, but also very similar in a lot of ways. There are various types which are appropriate to the project size, value and procurement method. They have the same interest in terms of aiming to provide important protection for main contractors, subcontractors and employers. They are vital for payments, guaranteeing work progress, providing mechanisms for dispute resolution and ensuring the required level of quality is achieved. It is fundamental for you to understand the type of contract you are signing up to and the contents, the supporting appendices, the extent of the standard forms of amendments, which are very common. And obviously, as part of my review now, I'm going to touch on two familiar contracts, one being the JCT Design and Build 2006 and the NEC4 Design and Build 2016. Why are they both? What do they both have in common? Sorry. Well, they're both standard forms of contract. They both include key personnel for administering the contract either a project manager, if you're looking at the NEC, or employee's agent, if you're looking at the JCT. They both provide um, for an employer to state a starting date, a completion date, access dates, and any sectional dates as required. They provide a price to be payable in the form of bill of quantities or activity schedule. Both have variation mechanisms. Variation or changes are more familiar under the JCT or compensation events under the NEC. They both provide options for employee design or contractual design responsibility. They both include a mechanism for making the contractor responsible by quality and workmanship in accordance with the contract. Both provide uh, processes for accepting any contractor's defects and both include valuation mechanisms for payment. They're both very versatile and have various options within uh, to suit the size, complexity type of work which you may be experiencing. They both allow for damages to be included for late completion by the contractor. Okay, next slide looks at managing change, variations and notices. Obviously all standard forms of contract have mechanisms for introducing variations and providing timelines for issuing notices. It's obviously important you review your contractual obligations to understand the process. This slide here touches on the JCT Design and Build 2016 main contract for payment processes and timeframes. As you will see, the interim valuation date is the last day, normally the last day of each month. Payment becomes due at seven days. Payment notice, five days after the due date. Final date for payment, 14 days after the due date. Option for a pay less notice, five days before the final date of payment. In most cases, this appears at the end of each calendar month, but I have been responsible for a project where the interim was actually a mid-month scenario, which made myself and my team uh, in a difficult position in terms of setting up the supply chain in the same manner. Not something I would probably recommend. Obviously beware because this is one key area where employers and also obviously main contractors look to heavily amend and make the periods uh, more favorable to the paying party position. Similar, for the um, NEC4 Design and Build 2016, again, there's a payment process and time frame. I would say the NEC is a more collaborative approach and uh, not as defined as the JCT. Clause 50.1, the project manager assesses the amount due at each agreed assessment date. 
Clause 50.2, the main contractor submits an application to the project manager before each assessment date. There's no time frame, but obviously consider giving the project manager sufficient time to consider the application. Clause 50.4, if no application is submitted, the amount due will be assessed by the project manager. The project manager will confirm if there is a payment or not. And obviously with reference to timing of assessment dates, each, well, end of each assessment date interval until the end of the defects certificate or termination certificate. But obviously, again, just beware and be mindful that this is one area uh, which does like to be amended by employers. Okay, managing change. So obviously it's important that variations are advised of as soon as they become apparent. Um, I would always recommend in the form of a, a written notice, whether this is some, some, some form of email or letter. Obviously check your relevant events you've agreed to within your contracts for extension of times and for entitlement for money. Uh, verbal variations must always be followed up in writing. Obviously provide detailed particulars in good time and in, in accordance with the requirements and the time frame in your contract. Do not let variations remain unagreed for long periods of time, which is obviously very common and that as I've experienced as well. Do not leave estimates or provisional figures in your valuation again for long periods of time, which again is very, very common for contractors and subcontractors. The longer you leave that, the more you know, unlikely it's going to be agreed. Just to recap on some key clauses within the JCT Design and Build 2016 main contract. Clause 3.5 covers changes issued by the employer. Clause 3.6 allows seven days for the main contractor to confirm compliance. Clause 3.7, verbal instructions must be confirmed in writing within seven days. And Clause 3.9 deals with instructions requiring formal change agreement. Clause 5.2 deals with the valuation of changes and the rules relating to other forms of changes. Okay, similar um, slide for the NEC for Design and Build 2016, again, the NEC is a bit more of a collaborative approach and not as formalised or defined as the JCT. Clause six uh, deals with variations known as compensation events, as I've mentioned previously. Clause 60.1 deals with compensation events from the project manager. Clause 61.2 deals with requests for main contractor to issue a quotation. Clause 61.3 deals with compensation events from the main contractor. The main contractor must notify of an event within eight weeks of becoming aware. This must include providing the further particulars, including cost, obviously something to be very mindful of. And the response period within the, sorry, the response period within this period is subject to obviously mutual agreement by both parties. Okay, just to summarize um, my, my slides. Um, so obviously I've just put together some practical tips, if you like, which hopefully may help you assist with um, your cash flow position. Just so you're mindful, there is obviously a default position, which is the Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act. And this obviously um, is all surrounding your payments and timeframes, et cetera. Something just to be mindful of if there's not something in your current contract for this. Uh, variations, I would always advise to try and agree them promptly. As I've said previously, you know, do not, the longer you leave it, the harder it is for them to be agreed. Vesting, something that's always there, which is not always used. It's a vesting agreement, which can be agreed between parties for any materials off-site. Uh, allows you to claim that element, that element of money within your interim valuation, although the materials are, are elsewhere and not on the project, just to be mindful. Timing of deliveries, it'd be good to liaise with your project teams just to ensure that certain deliveries are being you know, delivered within that month end, which obviously allows you to include that as materials on site within your valuations. Um, include everything, obviously your project team wish to include in valuation. So again, this is another conversation with your project teams, keep everything um, open with them in terms of um, you know, what's coming and when, if there's a certain delivery due to come, a day after your valuation, which is still within the month end, then even an order confirmation document may, may be sufficient to allow you to claim that element of money. Look to maximise your valuation. Obviously, this within reason, um, you know, based on the progress and, and the position you are at that, that point in time. And for me, it's it's building that relationship and trust with, with the paying party. You know, you know, try to be as uh, transparent as you practically can. 
and as reasonable as possible within the valuations just keep that relationship good um, and the better that relationship hopefully the more accommodating they'll be in terms of paying on time and obviously valuing applications um, and again just be, be cautious obviously with um, proposed contract amendments uh, review your contract thoroughly and uh, just make sure you're happy with them and obviously what you're signing up to obviously this all assists with you know effective cash flow in the long run that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. That was uh, a whistle-stop tour of contract administration, uh, well delivered. Uh, the takeaways uh, for me, and, and I think for most of the people that work in the construction industry, is whilst Dominic's referred to um, the standard form contracts there, the JCT and the NEC, and there obviously there are others, I think the main takeaway is, is that the standard form gets heavily amended in, in almost all circumstances that I've come across in, in my uh, 25 years of career. And it's understanding what those amendments are so that you're fully uh, you know, in, in control and managing your risk profile as you deliver your project under that contract. Um, so thanks for that, Dominic. Really, really good. Um, I'd like to invite Kevin now uh, to uh, give us his presentation on VAT, please. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Um, and, uh, and thank you. Yes, uh, my name's Kevin Hall. Um, I'm a VAT partner at um, Wright Hassel. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about um, the new VAT rules in the construction industry, um, commonly known as the domestic um, reverse charge. Uh, I've also got a few slides um, at the end here, which I, I may well not have time to touch upon uh, in any detail at all, but um, they, they might well be relevant um, for you if, you if you do work with property. One is early termination charges. Um, there's been a big change on that. Um, and uh, also a, a case which has come up recently um, where um, charging VAT, if you're in doubt, isn't always the best idea. So um, what is the domestic reverse charge? Uh, well, overall, the idea is um, the government thought um, that many subcontractors working in the construction industry were charging VAT to their customers, um, getting paid it. And instead of paying that VAT to HMRC, um, they were just running off with it. So um, HMRC have, have decided that the VAT should not be paid by the customer to the supplier. Um, the, the customer should pay that VAT directly to HMRC. Um, it's, it's an odd thing, the reverse charge. It's a bit counterintuitive. If effectively, the customer um, supplies the service to themselves when they're recording, um, recording the, the transaction for VAT. They charge VAT to themselves, and then they recover it themselves. So it's, it's a bit of a paper exercise in, in most cases, um, but it is counterintuitive. Um, it has been used... For, for many, many years in other, in other fields. Um, and, and the mechanism, you do get used to it and it does work quite well. Um, the difficulties come in other areas. Um, I should also say um, when this new measure comes in place, as I'm sure you're, you're all aware, um, it, it's gonna start in just a few days time on the 1st of March. So wh when do you use the reverse charge? Um, well, uh, it, it, the reverse charge is only going to, to happen between um, suppliers and, uh, and customers who, who supply on um, the, the, the original supplier service. So if somebody's um, plumbing in um, uh, to a building um, and they do that for a main contractor, main contractor is supplying the building works as a whole, they're actually going to incorporate the plumbing and use that um, in, in making their own supplies to their customer. That's the kind of area where the reverse charge is likely to kick in. It's not going to, to be a reverse charge situation where the customer is an end user. Um, but that's not the only test, and this is where we start to, to get some of the complexities coming in. Um, if the customer is not that registered, uh, there's no reverse charge. If the customer's not CIS registered, there's no reverse charge. If the supply that's being made is not a specified supply, uh, it's not in, in a, a list I'm about to show you, then, um, then, then there's no reverse charge, uh, generally speaking. 
it, th this does raise the question of doubt. Um, are we going to know all these things or, or do we suspect that these things are the case but but we don't have evidence for it sufficiently to know um, and HMRC have made an extraordinary statement I've, I've never seen this before that if as a supplier you're in doubt don't charge VAT apply the domestic reverse charge now you, you can see that leading to issues where you know a customer doesn't think they're reverse charging the supplier thinks they are and, and VAT simply doesn't get accounted for on the transaction um, it's the first time I've ever seen that, but um, uh, just to move on. Um, the, the list of specified supplies um, I've given you there on the slide, that's, that's taken directly from the legislation. It's drawn really quite widely. Um, you know, we all know about construction service being, you know, taking some bricks and, and building a wall out of them. Um, but, but it does include um, uh, painting, decorating, repairs. Um, stuff that, that you might not think of immediately as, as construction or, or sort of be doubtful about uh, where the boundary line is there. Um, what isn't reverse charged? Well, there are uh, also in the legislation some accepted supplies. Um, now certain installations are specified, but, but many installations are not. Um, professional services, advice architects, um, so on, um, labour equipment, all, all of these things are accepted supplies. They, they will not fall under the reverse charge. That is, unless, of course, they do fall under the reverse charge, um, and that can happen in a number of ways. So if um, one of those accepted supplies um, is a, a, an element of a, an overall single supply, which, which is a specified supply and does fall under the reverse charge, then, then that element that accepted um, activity that will also get reverse charged as well um, there's also the possibility for supplier and customer to agree a wider application across the site for um, for reverse charge supplies and accepted supplies all to be reverse charged um, so that there's there's a um, an element of confusion arising there as well uh, we've already mentioned that customers need to be CIS registered. Um, if the customer is an end user, you're, you're not going to apply the, the reverse charge. Um, there's also um, end users who aren't end users um, where the, the reverse charge won't apply. So if you take, uh, for example, um, uh, connected parties, and that includes parties who are third parties to each other, but have a, a, a common an interest in a, a common piece of land, such as a landlord and a tenant, um, then the landlord, although not strictly speaking the end user, the tenant is when the landlord recharges to them, um, the landlord also holds themselves out as an end user to, to the supplier. Um, I should mention as well that only supplies with positive rates of VAT are going to be reverse charged. There's obviously a lot of construction work that's zero rated for building new homes or um, uh, uh, um, supplying um, uh, for relevant charitable purpose or, or relevant residential purpose, you, these zero rated supplies uh, will not be reverse charged. Um, so cash flow, um, the big question, if you're a supplier, you're no longer going to be receiving the payment of VAT um, uh, on your uh, reverse charge sales. So what can you do? Well, you can go and get finance to, to, um, to, to see you over what, where you would have used that money for, for other things. But you can look at um, scenarios where are you now making pretty much only um, reverse charge sales um, and therefore there is no VAT liability to, to record on your VAT return. You'll have VAT on costs and, and maybe they outweigh the VAT liability you have. And if you're in, in that repayment position, why are you submitting VAT returns every three months? Why not consider going uh, onto a monthly VAT return and getting that VAT back from HMRC more quickly? That will certainly help cash flow. Um, what if you're on a, a flat rate scheme and you're accounting for VAT because it's simple at a fixed rate? You might even be making a profit um, from, from using that fixed rate. Um, and that might give you a lower liability than, than, than if you charge VAT at the standard rate. Well, um, great until you, you, you look at all the reverse charge supplies you're making and there's no VAT anymore on that, and you're still accounting for VAT at this flat rate. Um, it, it might make no sense. You'd have to look at the numbers, but think about coming off the flat rate scheme to, to, to save your cash flow. Think about monthly returns to improve your cash flow. It may or may not work, but it's, it's worth considering. Then I just don't have time for all of these. You've got all these different issues. Um, you, you, the supplies that you're making, some, some are, um, are going to be reverse charged, some are not, some are Section 106 um, 
uh, works, um, at, some are not, some are, uh, you're zero rating a supply for a dwelling, but you've got some accepted items in there. Do you zero rate, do you reverse charge, what do you do? Um, you've got projects which are partly standard rated work, partly reduced rated conversion work, partly zero rated work. How do you deal with that? Um, some suppliers, it's not clear what that, you've got overseas, um, sorry, some customers, are, it's not clear how you're going to deal with them. You've got overseas customers, you've got public private partnerships, um, all listed out there. Um, construction doesn't, it's not like you go to a till and you just sort of, you buy something, it's not instant. These things take time. I mean, some construction projects take 18 months, three years. Um, what happens to those supplies as they go across the 1st of March? When this all comes into force what about credit notes issued after the first of march for work before the first of march um there's there's even a, a de minimis um, element here legislation says a thousand pounds um below that you don't worry about the reverse charge i haven't seen that in um in the legislation specifically for construction only in the domestic reverse charge in other areas carbon tax credits electricity gas Th this there is however a de minimis um which was brought in a couple of months ago, quite late in the day, um, which is a 5% disregard, but it doesn't work in, in an intuitive way either. Um, so moving quickly on, because uh, my 10 minutes is, is pretty much up. Um, supplier, what should they do? Well, um, you, you need to ask your customer for their status. Are they an end user? Um, you need to ask um, uh, whether they're VAT registered. Uh, you need to ask whether they're CIS registered. You need to look at what supplies you're making and determine which ones are within the reverse charge and which ones you're going to, to charge VAT um, as usual. And then of course, you've got the question about what rate of VAT do, do you charge? Um, and you'll need to apportion your invoices between what's reverse charged and, and what isn't. Um, it, you, you also need to think about whether or not to use the flat rate scheme if you're on it, if you come off it. Um, whether or not to, to use monthly VAT returns, will that help? If you're the customer, you need to work out whether you're the end user and, and tell your supplier, I'm an end user, or if you're not an end user, but I'm VAT registered, I'm CIS registered, here we go. Um, and uh, you, you also need to be asking the supplier whether they're VAT registered, um, so you know whether to account for VAT uh, under the reverse charge. Um, you need to work out the nature of the supply for, for where you do apply the reverse charge. Um, and you need to work out the rate of VAT uh, on that reverse charge. Um, there's also a, a, an issue which needs to be dealt with between supplier and customer, um, and that is uh, a, an agreement for the reverse charge to be applied across the site for all the works that the supplier carries out, or, or whether, it sounds easier, but the customer might think, oh, crikey, I'm not going to um, uh, worry about whether there's an apportionment here, an apportionment there, is that reverse charge, is that not? I'm just going to take that one little bit that's reverse charged and do that. And the rest of it, I'm going to leave that for the supplier to deal with. So th there's a, a bit of discussion to be had there. Maybe you even enshrine that into um, a written agreement, which, uh, which my colleagues can help with. I said I don't have time to deal with early termination charges. It used to be thought uh, very quickly that um, a penalty for, for terminating a contract early was outside the scope of VAT, no VAT at all. A couple of European cases have turned that on its head. Um, HMRC are backpedalling on the guidance they've given, however. So yes, charge VAT on penalties these days, but do look very carefully at whether um, that's, that's right. There might be certain areas um, where that's not the case, dilapidations, for example, HMRC are having second thoughts about it, um, interest on late payments and so on and so on. Um, HMRC did also say they'd go back four years on this retrospectively. They've relented on that too. Um, and a, a recent case uh, of a, a contractor charging VAT because they weren't sure whether to or not. So surely I charge that. HMRC can't haul me over the coals if I get that wrong. Well, the customer tried to recover the VAT charge to them. HMRC said no. So a reputational issue for the supplier at that point. Um, the supplier then had the pain of going to HMRC to get back from them the VAT that uh, they'd accounted for on their VAT return. Um, that's painful, it's slow. Um, and uh, in the middle of it all, the supplier went bankrupt as well, leaving the customer trying to get the VAT back directly from HMRC, which failed. Um, it, a bit of a nightmare. It is always worth getting VAT at the outset um, to get the VAT rate right. Um, so that's me. Um, 
obviously you can't rely on anything I've said today. Um, uh, it's a bit of a joke, but in all seriousness, um, I don't know the, the um, I do know what I'm talking about on the VAT side, but I don't know the experience, the particular facts of, of your cases or your clients' cases. Um, by all means, contact me and, and um, we'll work something out on that. Um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Kevin. Um, and well done for squeezing all that detail into such a short space of time and giving us some takeaways. Um, I think what, what, what I've taken away is it, it's, it's, gonna, it's an incredibly confusing scenario that's about to uh, be embarked upon us. And I think, the, I think you and others in your field are going to be very busy uh, for the foreseeable future trying to sort out uh, the reverse charge issues. Uh, so thank you once again. So moving on to uh, the panel discussion, I'd like to now hand over to uh, Carlo, who, as I said, is going to moderate the panel discussion um, of Bill, uh, Kevin and uh, Philip. So uh, over to you, please, Carlo. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, and to start with, don't believe half of what Paul said about me at the start. Um, grossly exaggerated. <laughs> um, but anyway... Um, so I think the the first thing to say is that there is a group chat function in Zoom. I'm sure everyone is well aware of that, uh, having been using this for a year now. Um, if anyone uh, has got a question um, that arises out of something um, that was said either by Dominic um, or indeed by Kevin, do put that onto the group chat um, and I will try to, to work that in um, as time permits. Um, as a starter, I think we go back to Kevin, and um, I mean, it, it goes without saying that most of that uh, most of that detail left a lot of us behind, uh, left me behind certainly. Um, I mean, such is the complexity of, of these new um, rules that a lot of people are trying to campaign to um, to halt the process and to to stop the the changes being brought in. Is there any chance at all of that happening? And what might the implications be if it does? There, there are only a few days to go. Um, I, I very much doubt that, um, that there will be changes, but we have seen with this government before that um, a day or so before a deadline, that they are willing to, to change things and reverse. Um, if, if they do um, put in another deferral, on this and I, I can see why they would. I mean, we're in the middle of a pandemic still and, and we're suffering the after effects of, of Brexit, which has created all sorts of VAT issues. Um, they, they, the government may well defer um, again uh, on those grounds. And if they did, then it's business as usual uh, until um, the, the rules uh, come into force at the, at the deferred time. But I, I have not seen um, any whispers of that happening. And I would say that, that HMRC started um, on this about five years ago. And they, they, that the, the if in doubt, don't charge VAT statement indicates to me that this is a really big problem that the government is seeing. They're seeing a lot of VAT disappearing where they're prepared to say, don't charge VAT if you're in doubt. And they're prepared to let that VAT go at risk. Right. And having deferred it twice already, why, why would they defer again? Um, the, 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 the construction industry is in many ways separate from um, the, the, the Brexit issues. So I've, I've got a feeling they might well uh, continue um, pushing ahead with this on the 1st of March. Fair enough. Um, well, I mean, uh, again, going back to the, the complexities, I mean, the downsides um, mm. seem pretty clear um, in terms of the possibilities of getting it wrong um, and the implications for cash flow. Are there any particular positives that you would draw to, to everyone's attention? Uh, the, the reverse charge it has been used um, in, in many other fields, and it, it actually does work really rather well. Uh, and in many ways, it makes it simpler. If you're a, uh, a subcontractor, you, you've currently got the headache of, of, should I be charging VAT? If I charge VAT, should I be charging VAT at the standard rate, the reduced rate, zero rate? Um, and in many cases, you're working on a, uh, a building which has uh, offices or um, uh, a shop at the bottom, so that's commercial, that's one rate. You've got uh, uh, flats uh, or apartments above, so that's a different rate. If you're working on the roof, is it you know, all these questions to work out when you're you're trying to work out the VAT rate? And you know you're you're you know you're an electrician trying to get by, um, and you've been delivered this sort of legal headache. You won't have to do that when the reverse charge kicks in. 
So that's a positive. I mean, there are there are clearly sort of downsides in that you've now still got those questions in some areas and not in others, um, where you you will be reverse charging, but but you'll also be standard rating. Um, and it very much depends on on the individual subcontractor as to whether this is going to benefit them, or, or whether this is going to be um, something that's actually really tricky. And uh, and I, I do worry there's going to be a sizable contingent of people that this is going to be uh, more complicated for, not less. So um, just picking up on that point, there's a question that's come in um, from one of our attendees from SBP Limited um, about VAT registered clients contracted to um, energy suppliers, wiring in boilers, etc. Um, I mean, the premise here is that they're currently on the flat rate. Um, but are presumably concerned that they uh, may not be um, may not be charging the VAT as you outlined. Um, is this a particular um, scenario where you think that um, coming off the flat rate schemes they're on it would be a good idea? Uh, it, it illustrates the complexities of of, of thought on this. The simple answer is if, if this is all going to be reverse charged work, then come off the flat rate scheme. If this is not all going to be um, reverse charged work, then the flat rate scheme, if it's working for you, um, then stick with it. If it's going to result in half and half, some reverse charge, some not, you've got some number crunching to do. And the reason it's so complex is because the answer to those questions isn't going to be simple. Um, HMRC have issued some guidance um, in these sorts of areas and there, there is a real risk that this is not a reverse charge situation. Um, and uh, for example, it, uh, is, is the, the customer, although they look like an institution that is supplying on the, um, the wiring of the boiler, the, the, the construction work, um, is, are they in fact an end user under these complex end user rules? Um, and I, I have seen situations where yes, they are the end user, um, you also have contracts where, in fact, the supply is um, for wiring in the boiler of the end user direct, um, and yeah. Centrica um, will end up as the payer, but the contract isn't with Centrica. They're just uh, yeah. on the books of Centrica and get called out. There's all sorts of questions that need to be gone into yeah. before you can determine which, uh, which slot you fall into. That's very helpful. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so moving to a different aspect of cash flow, um, and we're going to build Bordeaux, um first on this one. Um, so, I mean, obviously, Bill, there's been a lot of different um, attempts to try and fix cash flow in the construction industry, going back to the Latham and Agron report, through to adjudication, partnering, and the prompt payment code. Um, we still have a problem, though. Um, cash flow is still um, a massive issue throughout the industry. What do you see as actually um, potentially making a positive impact on this um, in the industry? What can people do? Okay, well, that is a good question, Carla. Thank you. Um, I guess the question is what will make a difference? Um, you can see by the colour of my hair, I've had a very long um, career in construction and I have seen a difference. Believe me, 30 years ago, it was a hell of a lot worse than it is now. Um, however, it's not as good as it could get. Um, the prompt payment code came in in 2008, I think it was. Um, however, to sign up to the prompt payment code, um, a contractor only has to promise to make payments within 60 days. I'm not sure that I would class that as prompt. Um, it might be better than what people have been used to, but I don't think it's uh, where we need to be. I think we need to go much further than that. But until there's legislation on that, um, I think it's down to behaviours. And I think one thing that contractors can do is change their arrangement or agreement with their paying party from a transactional arrangement to a relational arrangement whereby um, they have a greater value. So it it's, needs to be well understood that main contractors can't deliver their work without subcontractors. But if all those subcontractors are, are employed on a transactional basis, the payment mechanisms aren't going to improve. The subcontractors need to develop relational arra arrangements with the main contractors, whereby they're in a position that late payment would cause them a real problem, cause them a problem on other projects. And that's something that we see uh, more and more, um, particularly since the, the prompt payment code. So I think that's a positive change that's come about. Um, 
what what can what can go beyond that? Well, I think that's um, it's it's about going back to the contracts, about understanding your contract administration and all, all the things that Dominic was talking about, um, making sure that the payment mechanism in the contract is unambiguous. For example, I've seen recently um, a situation where the payment uh, term said invoice uh, and payment due on month end. Well, there's a whole issue around raising invoices as a payment application. If we put that to one side, what does month end mean? Does it mean the calendar end, end of the month or does it mean the last working day of the month? Um, and the, the payment mechanism in the act and supported by the scheme requires you to, a, you, you to be able to peg a precise date to the day that your payment is due. And that's not possible with ambiguous payment terms. So the, the very first step is to make sure that you've got unambiguous and clear payment terms, a, 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 an easily understood payment mechanism, and then administer that mechanism. So we quite often see contractors complaining that payments are late, but when we look at the payments that they've applied for, um, they've not applied in the correct way or on the correct time, or they haven't served the, net, the, the payment application properly. Um, so it really does come back to behaviors Things like, for example, the, the schedule of payment dates. Um, if, if the schedule runs out at the end of the contract period, what happens if the contract is extended? So if the contractor gets an extension of time, but there has been no change to the payment schedule, technically he's not entitled to any further payments until he's completed his works. So I would recommend that all contractors have a payment schedule that is way, way beyond the practical completion date of the works, or there is an agreement at the start as to how that payment schedule should be adjusted in the event of an extension of time. So it comes back to behaviours and, and again, what's written into the contract. Um, other things- Really that comes back happen, to thinking about it at the start. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Pre pre prepare for the worst, I guess, is, yeah. is, is what's, what's, uh, what the advice is. I mean, another aspect is retention. And I know there's a big move at the moment to try and abolish retentions. Um, the cynic in me tells me that's not going to improve because many contractors do rely on retention funds to, to part finance their businesses. So I think what might be the downside of getting rid of retentions is that the main, some main contractors, the unscrupulous ones, actually reduce their payments, um, the gross amount that they pay to the contractors. So actually the, the, the subcontractors aren't receiving any more money, but they've got no retention that they could fall back on later. The, the big issue here is um, if a main contractor holding a retention pot goes bust, before he's paid that money out. So he's actually lost his subcontractor's money. He's not lost his own money. Um, and and that, that is a big issue. So that, that money could be paid into retention bonds. There's a whole yeah. list of scenarios, escrow accounts, trust accounts. Uh, there's a retention deposit scheme being talked about. Um, I mean, I remember years ago, it wasn't uncommon for major contracts to have uh, project bank accounts in those days. And uh, that, that seemed to work well, but it, it just seems they're expensive and, and nobody's forcing the issue. So hopefully the, the move at the moment to abolish retentions is actually forcing the issue to do something about it. And I think probably the solution would be escrow accounts or, or something of that order. Um, yeah. but, but I think just, just to go to one final point, in changing behaviours, I think a payee, so the person receiving the payment or, or, or not receiving the payment, as the case may be, um, they need to stand firm, make themselves a nuisance. By making yourself a nuisance, a, a, a main contractor will pay you in preference to paying somebody else. And, and I've seen it several, several times where main contractors will only pay when subcontractors chase them up. That's when it's a transactional arrangement. If it's a, if it's a relational uh, agreement between them, they will generally pay on time. And we do see lots of that. I must say, since the prompt payment code, although I was sceptical of it at the start, I have seen quite a lot of improvements over the years. Bearing in mind that came out in 2008. Um, so yeah. I think by standing firm, you, you go back to Dominic's advice, and that is try and negotiate with your, your, your paying party. That's your first port of call. If, if you're still not getting paid, then 
most contracts, certainly the JCT, would give you the right to suspend work after a notice and a period of time. And, and that ultimately could be to terminate the contract. Uh, that's a very drastic step. And let's hope we, you know, we don't get to that. But, but the next step would be to adjudicate or mediate or arbitrate, litigate, um, yeah. or just accept it. <laughs> that's, that's the final option. Um, well We'll go to um, we'll go to some dispute related questions um, in a moment. But yeah. just picking up on um, on what you were saying there, Bill, um, and the real the need to think about these sorts of issues at the start. Of course, there's a bit of an overlap between um, the these sorts of issues, the sort of the payment mechanisms that you need to think about at the start, and also the VAT issues that Kevin was talking about earlier. Um, and this is probably a question for um, for Dominic, Bill, or, or Paul, I would imagine. Um, but do any of you see that the VAT issues that um, that we've been talking about are going to have any sort of impact on contract pricing and contract pricing documents in particular? So your bill of quantities um, or the like. Are you going to have to have that specifically broken down into VAT non VAT items? I, I don't foresee any problems. Um, I haven't really given it a great deal of thought, to be honest, um, but I've not heard of any major problems coming from this. I don't know, Paul, have you got something to add to that? All I'd say is that, um, I mean, normally in a bill of quantities or an activity schedule, they are priced excluding the VAT. It is a, it is a common known factor that VAT will be added to the invoice on the applications as, as the jobs progress. But I don't think the reverse fat charges uh, is going to have any impact on how a job, a bill of quants, an activity schedule <laughs> price from the get go. It will be as it's always been. And that's what we're seeing. I mean, we're involved in a, a couple of pre-contract uh, projects at the moment where we're doing bills of quants and, and activity scheduling. And this hasn't come up from the employer. Uh, and these projects are about to start in the next couple of weeks. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't see any impact. Fair enough. Um, so, as I said, uh, we're going to look a little bit more at disputes now. Um, so if we can imagine that uh, you as a contractor are finding yourself facing a dispute, um, Dominic, what would you say are the two or three key things that the contractor can do in, in preparing and getting himself in the best position to face that dispute? Yeah, of course. Um, from, from my experience, really, um, in the first instance, I would always try and agree the, the issue amicably between the parties. I think, I think you know, from, from my years in contracting, that's always the first point of call, really. You know, I'll take a commercial view. I'll take a, a view on the liability of the package, if you like, or I'll take a, a view on the commercial position of the project. Um, I, you know, I'll consider whether we want to actually use this, this contractor or subcontractor again. Did they do a good job? Um, and I'll take all that into consideration before, you know, I go down the, the sort of dispute route, if you like. But, you know, if that fails and it is definitely going to be a dispute, I think the, the first sort of tip I would say is obviously make sure you're fully correct in your argument. You know, make sure that your assessment is very clear. If you've looked at all the detail and you're, you know, not unbiased, if you like, but you're in a position where you think you are right. And, you know, if it goes to all the way, it goes all the way. Uh, number two, I would say records, and, that, and that's that's fundamental for me. I just make sure that, you know, if you do get to a dispute situation, uh, you know, for example, if I pick one up now, a, a claim, if you like, I need to make sure that, you know, there's ad adequate records in terms of, you know, it could be anything from allocation sheets, it could be detailed cost invoices, it could be, you know, anything that, that substantiates and demonstrates your position. So I just can't, you know, can't uh, say, it, say it, you know, that's, that's to me, that's a key key area to make sure those records are there and this is sufficient the third third thing is obviously you, as i mentioned before you can go into a bit of a biased scenario where you, you know you work for a main contractor you, you think you're right and you're adamant you're right i'd also take a, a view from an impartial person whether it's a someone like decipher or someone similar where they can take a, an overall view and actually advise you um, whether you are right and if there is a compromise and you have looked at this and looked at that I would always, I'd always seek that that advice, and that, and that'll be my three, my three tips really, Callum. Yeah, fair enough. No, that that makes a lot of sense, a lot of sense, and it also accords with my own experience. I mean, there's no substitute to getting advice and getting advice early. 
Um, and secondly, I, my own experience of giving that sort of advice is almost always to go back to the um, to go back to the contemporaneous records. So you've got your invoices, you've got your payment applications, but you've also got your minutes of site meetings and all the rest. I mean, those need to be maintained, and it's the situations where you haven't got those that I find are the uh, are the real sort of fifty fifties. You, you don't really know what what has happened and you you might want to really uh, think carefully before I think going down um, a dispute um, a, a dispute route um, so if a dispute is inevitable um, and I think this is probably a question for Bill um, what um, what, what would you say um, are a few practical tips if, if that dispute is going to take the form of an adjudication? Well, the first step is to go back to the contract and comply with the contract implicitly. So whatever the contract says in terms of adjudication or, or whatever form of dispute resolution um, there is available, um, you need to, need to go back to that. And also the, the, the payment mechanism and look back at how, how applications have been submitted um, and more importantly, perhaps the records, because it's the records that provide the evidence. So it's, it's a case of setting your stall out and making sure that you've got a, a solid case that you can rely upon. Um, so, for instance, when you make payment applications, make sure that materials on site are supported by perhaps delivery notes or invoices or photographs to evidence that they're on site. What you're looking to do is not convince the people who are involved in the project, but if you are going to adjudication, you're looking to convince somebody who's got no knowledge of the project, who never visited site, so that the records must demonstrate clearly that what you included in your payment ac application is an accurate representation of work completed or materials on site or off site, however the situation might be. So in, in summary there, the tips are, Go back to the contract, make sure you've complied with it and make sure that your payment applications are submitted properly. So that that's served on time in the correct way, served really or prepared really as a formal claim. That's because ultimately you may need to rely upon it um, in an adjudication. And I, I would I'd possibly also add one more to that, which is it comes back to my point earlier about getting early advice. Um, adjudication in particular, as um, most people, I think, on this um, on this session will know, has an incredibly truncated time period. The last thing you want to be doing is scrabbling around trying to get expert evidence or trying to get your ducks in a row halfway through the process. So make sure you have your ducks in a row before you start. Um, I, I mean, I've seen so many cases where, where people haven't done that and have paid for it. Um, so moving on from there, let's imagine that you've um, that you've got your adjudication award. Um, you um, had a it was a smash and grab adjudication. Um, what um, what happens once you've got that award, um, Philip? And um, also for those that don't perhaps know, what is a smash and grab adjudication, and uh, what's the future? Um, of those sorts of adjudication. Lot to unpack there. Okay, well, let's keep this very simple. So normally when we're talking about uh, smash and grab adjudication, <laughs> we're talking about a situation where the payer has failed to serve a notice, one of the notices that he's required to serve under the contract. Perhaps he's failed to serve a pay less notice or he's he was supposed to certify and he's, there is no certificate. So in that situation, the amount applied for by the, the payee, uh, let's call them the contractor, um, that amount has become the notified sum. And because of the machinery of the act and or the scheme, um, the, the notified sum has become due and payable. So in the absence of a pay less notice, he says, right, I'm going to adjudicate. And, and basically there is no defense to this because the proper notices haven't been served. And so my application became the, the notified sum. And the courts will say, 
<laughs> yes, that's right. Um, so if it goes to adjudication, the adjudicator says, I'm constrained here, I'm straight jacketed, um, I award uh, the notified sum because there wasn't a pay less notice. And then on enforcement, it goes to the court and the court sort of rubber stamps it and says, well, yep, uh, that was a notified sum, no pay less notice, here's your money. So where it gets interesting is what is the status of, of that that notified sum and, and, and that decision. And in an earlier judgment, um, the court in the uh, ISG and Civic College case said, there's no right to challenge this. Um, you can't um, challenge this by a true value adjudication and start a second adjudication over what the proper value should be. Um, you, you're prevented from doing that because that's the way the act operates and you simply are stuck with the notified sum that's been awarded by the adjudicator but things moved on and um, in the case of S&T and Grove in 2018 the uh, Court of Appeals said no that that's not right um, uh, there, there is a right to start a second adjudication to establish the true value. But first of all, you've got to pay the smash and grab adjudication. So the you know, before you can do your second adjudication over value, you've got to have paid the smash and grab adjudication. And there's quite an interesting sort of analysis there where the court says, uh, look, there, there are two bargains, there are two obligations. There's a payment bargain and um, the person who doesn't pay the notified sum in the absence of a pay less notice is in breach of that payment bargain. But there's also a valuation bargain, which gives, um, the payer the right to say, hey, your I know I didn't put in a pay less notice, but your application was actually in the wrong value. So I'm going to kick off my second uh, challenging um, true value um, application and prove that actually I owed you nothing or whatever the case uh, may be. Uh, and just briefly, in, in uh, 2020, we've got quite an interesting case, uh, J&B Hopkins against trans um, engineering, where what had happened um, was that there had been a certificate, there had been a failure to put in a pay less notice or otherwise to challenge it. But then there was a sequence, uh, another certificate and so on. Um, and the courts have always recognised that a, a, a later um, certificate, a later valuation can correct um, a, an earlier certificate. So it was being argued in that case, oh yes, well we know that our certificate number X, whatever it was, pick a figure 32, um, uh, we know that certificate wasn't challenged and so theoretically became payable, but look, it's all moved on. We've got certificate 33, et cetera. And because of that, you can't go back and uh, adjudicate on certificate 32. And the court said, no, that's not right. Uh, if there's been a failure to um, challenge the the earlier certificate by a pay less notice or whatever, it has been a failure to pay the notified sum. Uh, the person, the payee in that position can um, go off um, and adjudicate that, even though things have moved on in the sequence of further uh, valuations. And he, he still has the right um, to adjudicate over non payments of the. Um, the earlier certificate. So the court wasn't saying uh, you can't correct a valuation in a later valuation. They were saying you can correct it in a, a later valuation, but still, if you've not put in your pay less notice, you have to pay up on that, that earlier certificate. Mm -hmm. uh, and then just very briefly, the landscape of course has changed with this case of um, Bresco Electrical and Michael Lonsdale. Uh, we used to think that you couldn't um, adjudicate if you were a company, an insolvent company in liquidation. Uh, the Bresco case um, says that actually an adjudicator has got jurisdiction to um, resolve a claim um, 
by being made by an insolvent party. Um, so uh, that's interesting. And I'll just end by saying very, very briefly, there has been a relatively recent case, John Doyle against Eris um, contractors. Um, and in that case, the court looks at five uh, circumstances in which the court would consider, possibly consider, that's all they're saying, uh, the, the enforcement, you know, allowing the enforcement of an adjudication by an insolvent party. So we thought the position was until very, very recently um, that it was an exercise in futility to even think about um, adjudicating if you were an insolvent party because the court just either wouldn't enforce it or we would slap a stay, stop the enforcement um, because the courts were concerned that if an insolvent party uh, adjudicated and won, um, when there was a, a subsequent true value challenge to that, um, the responding party wouldn't be able to get his money back. But so things, things have moved on. Have a look at John Doyle and Erith, uh, five circumstances in which the court will at least entertain the uh, enforcement of an adjudication by an insolvent party. So there's quite a lot going on there. Carlo, back to you. Thanks. Indeed. No, thank you very much, Philip. Um, I think perhaps uh, given uh, the sort of headline of our um, of our day to day was um, VAT and the new rules, uh, probably the uh, the appropriate end point is to come back to Kevin and really just ask um, for you, Kevin, to just sum up what you think the trickiest bits of the new rules are and perhaps also what happens if you um, as someone trying to navigate this, this quagmire, actually get things wrong? Yeah, um, very interesting questions, Carly. Um, uh, in a nutshell, it, it's, it's not entirely clear what's going to happen if, if things do go wrong. Um, it, it is hoped that HMRC will apply light touch. Um, there's always a question as to, as to what that means. Um, and there's also uh, the question of, of penalties if things go wrong um, for tax. That's very much dependent on, on how you behave. So if you're cooperative and timely and all the rest of it, and you're not concealing and, and deliberately getting things wrong, um, then the, the, the penalties will be low. But the penalties are a percentage of the, of the, the, the tax that is lost to, to HMRC or, or potentially lost. And, and what is lost here? Um, very often there's, there's going to be no loss of tax overall at all. Um, so there's, there is a real question as to, to whether there's, um, there's going to be penalties at, at, at any level. Um, but obviously you don't want the black mark against your name for, for, for getting things wrong. Um, in terms of the trickiest parts, um, I, I, I touched on in my, my and I'm sorry, it, it, it lost, um, lost you a bit there, Carly. It, it is a complex area and that is the, the single trickiest part working out what to reverse charge and what not to uh, and and getting all the moving parts to to get those moving in the correct way to give you the right answer so that you reverse charge the correct parts and you you apply vat in the correct parts once you've got that sorted out you then have the the the, the other tricky elements of how are you going to deal with that in practice um, are you going to have to complete a, a reverse um, charge sales list as you do for other um, uh, other um, anti-avoidance reverse charge mechanisms? Um, are you going to come off the flat rate scheme? Is it is it going to pay? Are you going to go on a monthly uh, VAT return arrangement or, or is that um, not quite going to work out for you and, and, and maybe you shouldn't? Um, in, in practice, to try and preserve... Uh, as much cash in your cash flow as possible. There's there's a lot of work to do um, at, at groundwork level to get to get the answers out before you can you can model the cash flow and and then do something sensible to help yourself. Thank you, Kevin. That's very very helpful. Um, I think that is everything we have time for today. So really, back over to um, to Paul. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Carlo. <clears throat> so uh, I think the, in terms of the questions that we had from the audience, <clears throat> excuse me, the, uh, I think you cleverly dealt with those, Carlo, within the panel session. So thank you for dealing with those. I think we've answered all of those. Um, closing for myself is, uh, you know, I think the industry 
we need to continue to work together to support the long-term health of our sector. Um, and to do this, I see this by constructively uh, resolving disputes and working together collaboratively, ensuring the cash flow continues to flow. And I think there's an added complexity now, as we've already alluded to, with the VAT issues and how that plays out. And I think there's a minefield ahead. So I think it's going to need the parties to work uh, even more closely together uh, to ensure that the cash flow, which is the lifeblood uh, of our industry, continues. Because if we go back to that Begbie's trainers report, um, there are some tough times ahead. Uh, so uh, we all need to work together in that regard. So there are no more questions from the, uh, from the audience that I can see. I would like to uh, thank uh, the speakers, uh, Carlo for, for, for moderating, uh, all of the speakers for giving up their time and preparing for this session. These webinars, they don't happen overnight. They take a bit of time to work together. We all, we all know that in terms of you know, those that are involved with webinars. Uh, and I'd also uh, like to thank Stuart and Annie from Limeslave for facilitating. Uh, and once again, I, I found it a really enjoyable session. I'd like to thank the attendees uh, for those that have attended and made it today. There will be a recording of this uh, for, uh, for the future uh, use for those that haven't been able to attend. And I wish you all well uh, and thank you and keep safe. Goodbye for now. Thanks, boys. Thank you.